I want to talk about the storage controller and the software within the storage controller. And specifically what I want to talk about is the increase in capacity. Now, my, my background is uh, block storage, so we're going to be focusing mostly on uh, block storage here in this session. Um, and the first question that needs to be asked is, well, what's new? If we scratch our heads really hard, we could probably think of one or two opportunities in the past in which we've already increased capacity, right? It's actually something that happens all the time. So what's unique now? And I want to talk about that a bit. There are unique circumstances today, and I think we also have unique tools and um, some solutions that can be used in order to have the storage controller and its software have the ability to properly support all the increased capacity that we're seeing. Um, another question that I want to ask is, okay, we understand we have increased capacity, but we don't necessarily have other resources within the, control, in, within the controller increasing accordingly. And what could we do in our software to adapt to that situation? So, firstly, capacity is only one of many factors within the storage controller. Obviously, workload is a big factor within the resources that a storage controller requires and the software requirements. This directly leads us to performance considerations. And another big point is the feature set. What is our storage controller able to do? Can it do things such as disaster recovery, high availability, security, data reduction, and so on. Today, typically, the answers to those questions are yes, and therefore, we have extra work within our storage controller in addition to just managing the capacity. So, we all know these rules of thumb that tells us how capacity is going to increase over time, uh, but I prefer to rely on professional market research. So let's have a look at that for a moment. So here I have some information taken from uh, IDC that shows the increase in storage capacity, specifically for enterprise storage systems, which is what interests me at least. But um, it is a, world, a worldwide market, so it um, is very indicative. Um, we see on the slide where we are today in this graph, and roughly you can see that the capacity, talking about shipped capacity here, the shipped capacity increases um, or doubles around every three years, approximately. It is interesting to note that specifically in 2019, it seems like there's going to be a slightly more uh, moderate increase than other years, but again, it averages out over time. And we're seeing this capacity increase continuously, and it's going to continue in the near future based on reliable market research. Okay, so having understood that, we have workload, we have controllers, and it is somewhat obvious that as we add workload, we need to add more controllers. And a controller is a full set of resources within the controller. And workload scales linearly as we scale our controllers as well. But now the question is, we add capacity. How does that affect our controller? And here the question, the answer isn't as obvious because it has influence on the controller from multiple perspectives. One perspective is, a customer has purchased additional capacity. And the reason that he purchased this additional capacity is because he wants to run new applications, additional workloads. He wants to have more business on this capacity. And therefore, what we have is a link from the capacity directly to the workload. And as we already said before, the workload will influence our controller with all its resources. However, Capacity also has a direct influence on the controller. And if we break that down a bit, looking at the flow of the workload, we influence RAM, we influence CPU, bus, internet, all the infrastructure of our controller is influenced by the workload. But in addition to that, we have a direct influence of capacity on RAM, and we'll further discuss that in, uh, in the next slides. And this use case is a customer saying, I need more capacity, my capacity is running low, but I don't necessarily need to put new applications or a heavier workload on my storage. So 
I don't need to buy another controller, I don't need more CPU, for example, or whatever it might be, but I do need more capacity, and how is my controller going to support that, that increase? Okay, so a bit about what we have in the RAM of the controller. I pointed out in the previous slide that increasing capacity has a direct influence on our RAM utilization, and why is that? So there are several um, consumers, primary consumers, there are many, but let's just talk about a few, that influence the usage of RAM within the controller. So one, the first one, is physical capacity management. We need to somehow manage our storage, and today a storage controller isn't just running thick provisioning that write it and I'll put it wherever it goes and that's it. We have data reduction, we have thin provisioning, and everything is getting written somewhere else, and the layer of physical capacity management requires memory, lots of memory, and not only that, it also scales as capacity scales. Another user of RAM is a read-write cache, very typical for a storage controller to have such a thing to improve performance. Uh, a third point, virtual to physical lookup. This is when, for example, we're performing a read. A user will read from a particular uh, LBA offset within a volume, and we need the ability to find that particular block of data in the entire storage. And for that, we have metadata, supporting metadata, that helps us with all this lookup process. Um, last but not least, storage controllers that implement deduplication also have an additional overhead, and that's because the way deduplication is implemented is that it uses fingerprints or hashes that identify data, and this is more of a write flow thing, but when we're performing a write, we want to look up within the system to see if this data already exists, and we compare it to other hashes in the system. We have this deduplication database holding all these hashes, that as well consumes memory. So, these factors, sometimes, depending on your architecture, they may be joined together in different types of structures. You might also have additional types of structures, but let's focus on these for now. And now I want to ask is, okay, if I'm scaling my storage, how is it going to influence these structures? Okay, so, we're adding storage. And let's review these and look at them and see, let's ask ourselves, what do I need to increase just because I increase storage? And again, I'm not even looking at a workload right now. Let's assume the workload is constant. We still need additional RAM resources. Okay, if we look at physical capacity management, we have more physical capacity, we need more RAM to manage it. Read-write cache, that's more workload dependent. Therefore, if we're not changing the workload, we could probably get away with the same amount of RAM that we've had previously, in spite of the fact that we increased capacity now. Virtual to physical lookup, once again, more physical capacity, more virtual capacity, requires more metadata, and the deduplication database as well, it is a factor of the virtual capacity, and therefore the size of the deduplication database is going to increase just by increasing the amount of storage, again, without even changing our workload. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about RAM. We are you're talking, we said that storage is increasing. So something happened to the slide when passing it on. I don't know what happened to the text here, but we'll make do. Um, uh, the obvious solution would be Great, let's increase RAM and we're done, right? So the problem is, is that the current situation of the market is that RAM supply is problematic and there are some quotes here from uh, Gartner and IDC uh, stating these facts that RAM is expensive and it's difficult to increase RAM in your system without significantly increasing the price of, uh, of our controller. So that we don't necessarily want to do. So assuming RAM is, at least at the moment, not scaling as storage is, how can we, in our software, increase the efficiency of our mechanisms to, to support greater storage with the same amount of RAM? <laughs> 
Okay, and that's what, that's what this slide asks, and this is one of the, the main points here. We want to be able to handle more data with the same amount of RAM, and it's not necessarily the same amount of RAM, even you have an increase in RAM. The main point is, is that the proportional increase changes. We're increasing storage faster than we're increasing RAM. And again, this is at least the market at its current state. In 2020, there are different predictions. Price of RAM is, at least based on certain predictions, may plummet, and this situation may change. But again, looking at today, a time frame of several years, this is what we currently have. Okay, so one of the solutions that can be implemented is swappable structures from memory. Now let's dive in a bit. If we look at the deduplication database, how can we swap this out? Assuming we want to swap it, based on what will we perform this swapping? So deduplication, it is by nature content-based. What you do is you calculate a fingerprint, you calculate a hash on the data, whether it's 4K or 8K or 16K or whatever chunk your system uses, and that identifies that chunk of data. Now, a chunk of data that's used often means the hash will be in the database and will have many hits, and therefore we want data that's common to remain in memory, and data that does not have hits in the database, it's not commonly used, it doesn't repeat itself in the storage system, that we want to swap out of memory and put on storage until we maybe need it in some uh, future situation. When we look at the virtual to physical lookup, so again, we're still talking about the swapping, but here the swapping is based on a different parameter. Here the swapping is based on location, where location is the position within your volume. I'm reading or writing, performing some sort of I.O. on my volume. I have a volume now that's hot, another volume that is not being used or hasn't been used for quite a while now, and therefore I want to prefer having um, my metadata for volume A in RAM, whereas for volume B, I don't need that in RAM right now, and I could have that swapped out to disk. And of course, the granularity doesn't have to be a volume, it could also be less, it's just a very convenient example. The physical capacity management structure, it has its own uh, criteria, and here the criteria is what's changing on the drives themselves, where we have free capacity, where um, are we using capacity, where are we filling in holes and changing the layout of the drives themselves, and obviously writes affect this more than reads, reads do not affect this, but what we want to do is have areas of the disk that are changing in memory, whereas areas that have been written or have not been changing for a while, whether because they're free and they're not used or because they're written and not used, then we don't necessarily need to have it in memory. And the fact is, is that even on primary storage, a lot of the data is cold. It's not always used all the time. And I'm not talking about a time frame of weeks or months here. I could be talking about a time frame of, of even minutes, because if we swap in and out, that is an operation that comes at a penalty, it comes at a cost, yes, but it's not something that takes us minutes to do. It happens within milliseconds, this swap in and swap out operation. So if we're looking at a point in time, even at a scale of minutes, within minutes, a typical storage does not access everything that it has written. So, therefore, it is quite simple to define areas of interest for the user, and only within these areas of interest hold the relevant metadata within memory. Uh, another important point is that this can be tailored to a specific workload. And here I give two examples. One example is read versus write, and another example is random versus sequential. Now, let's dive in a bit deeper to the read-write example. Going back to the four structures I've been talking about until now, let's look at what we need for a read and what we need for a write. So, if I'm talking about deduplication database, the purpose of this is to find matches. Finding matches happens when we're writing new data into the system. When you perform a read, you don't need this information at all. And therefore, if your workload is now reads, what you could do is you could swap out 
more information from the database and evict it from memory and swap in other structures that you require more. Okay, read-write cache, you, we need for both reads and writes. Virtual to physical lookup, we also require for both reads and writes. But physical capacity management, again, is required only for writes because read do not change the physical layout of anything on disk. It's true there can be garbage collection happening in the background, but again, garbage collection will be doing writes, even if it's not user writes, they're internal writes. And if the workload now we have is focusing on reads, we could also not just shift out different areas of a specific structure to favor different areas of that structure. We could also shift out, for example, the deduplication database and favor the virtual to physical um, lookup. And the strength here is when it's done at fine granularity, not at system level. We want to be able to, I'd say, below volume at least, right? But uh, to, to each his own, what is the correct granularity here? But once the decision is made at a finer granularity, you're better able to adapt to the user's workload. Okay, another uh, big one. I've already had some help this morning on this topic. And those of you that are overly perceptive will notice that the graphic on the top right was taken right out of the presentation from this morning, so thank you very much to Intel. Um, so storage cast memory and NVRAM. What do we get from this? And now I'm looking at the perspective again of our storage controller. So first thing we could gain is metadata persistency. And even though this has less to do with capacity, it is the main point. It's right in the name, right? Non-volatile RAM, that's, that's what's right in there. But it's not just that. And what's equally important, or maybe even more important, is the fact that with the help of NVRAM, we could increase the amount of RAM in the system significantly. And what could we do with it, for example? A read-write cache is a very good example of something that does not necessarily have to be in RAM all the time. The price of going to get our read-write cache from NVRAM, as a, the performance price I'm talking about, as opposed to going to a RAM, is not such a big difference. And definitely, the cache is a very good candidate to move out of RAM and move down to NVRAM. But, but that's not it. There's more than just the cache. If we look at memory structures, and we discuss swapping, so until now, my assumption was when I swap it, I swap it out to, uh, to media. And that's not necessarily the case. Once we have NVRAM, we can swap it out to NVRAM instead of sending it down to, even if it's Flash, obviously the performance of NVRAM is way greater than the performance of Flash. And therefore, when we're talking about memory structures, it makes sense to do that. Now, what I'm trying to show here is, well, I call it memory structure tiering. And in the past, what we're familiar with is that we had tiering for data. Right? We had a storage system that may have had a combination of HDDs and SDDs, and the storage performed tiering on data, where data that was less interesting, less often accessed, would be moved out to the HDDs, and whereas data that was accessed more often, or that was more performance sensitive, would reside on the SDDs, and you had intelligent systems performing all that tiering for you, and then you would benefit from both words, you get your capacity from the HDDs, and you'd get your performance from the SDDs. So that, that's pretty much history, but I'm using it as an analogy to what we could do today with RAM and NVRAM. And with RAM and NVRAM, we could do the same thing that we did with data, we could do it now with metadata. So when we're talking about our metadata, again, as the examples I've brought before, we have areas of interest that will be within RAM, and the areas of slightly less interest will be pushed down to NVRAM, which is still very accessible compared at least to having it put down, swapped out to storage. So that's a very big uh, advantage. And since the capacity of the NVRAM is significantly larger, as we already saw, than the RAM itself, we're able to scale our, our RAM and get a very good benefit from this, and this does help us to support the storage that we require, the extra capacity that we require. Okay, another couple things that uh, 
are good to consider. So another point is that the metadata itself is typically a factor of the chunk size that we manage. And the chunk size usually comes from deduplication, uh, for it could be 8K or 16K, for example, and the chunk is a unit of data for which you have an entry of metadata for. So clearly, the more chunks you have, you're going to have more entries of metadata, and therefore, the larger your chunk is, the less metadata you're going to have for a given size of capacity. So another solution can be to take your chunk size and increase it. It does come with a disadvantage, particularly for deduplication. The larger your chunk is, then you might be missing some deduplication. For example, if you use a chunk size of 32K, but you're having repetitions of 16K, then you're not going to be detecting that deduplication. So it does come at a cost, but it is something that can be considered. Another point of interest, this also comes from the world of deduplication, is looking at the deduplication database. So looking at this, uh, this square, what this represents is 16 entries um, or 16 chunks, which are 16 entries within the deduplication database. Each square here is an entry of metadata. So we would require for 16 chunks, 16 entries for meta of metadata within our deduplication database. Now the thing is that that's not necessarily the case. We can perform optimizations in which we say, well, you know what, in my database I'm not going to hold an entry of metadata for every physical chunk. Rather, I'm just going to hold up a portion of them. Okay, in this example, I highlighted six, and therefore my RAM consumption is going to go from 16 units down to six units. Now, the question you're probably asking is like, okay, great, that's very smart, but now that I don't have my entry in the database, how am I going to find deduplication? So, there are answers to that question. Um, by implementing supplemental mechanisms that support deduplication. I'll just give one example. One example is to perform deduplication lookup based on an area, and by that, what happens is that you have an entry in the database to provide you with an initial hit to an area of where I see similar data, and then once you have that, you go and search that for uh, data that's equivalent and you go perform deduplication. There are other possibilities and mechanisms, but here the point is, is that there is an option to reduce the size of our deduplication database and save RAM again. Okay, until now I discussed about RAM, what we could do about it, and what changes we could make to our architecture to allow us within the same amount of RAM to provide better coverage of our metadata for increased storage. Now I want to move on to another point, and that's proliferation of storage objects. And this is a slightly different challenge, but what it means is we don't only have more capacity, but we also have more entities. We have more volumes. Within volumes, I also include snapshots. We have more pools, and we have more mirrors, and, and so on. And we need to make sure that we're able to accommodate that. Now, this is caused by several factors. One factor is what we've been talking about until now is increased capacity, more capacity, more objects, so we need to be able to support more objects, but that's not it. Another factor are uh, virtual volumes. Virtual volumes is not a very um, new technology, but it started off with a relatively slow adoption rate, and we see support for it increasing and we also see the adoption rate slightly increasing. So I'm not bringing any market analysis here, right? But if you see your customers expressing interest in virtual volumes, then looking into the issue of many objects is something that you're going to need to do. And the third point is CDP, continuous data protection. This comes primarily from the world of security. And what happens is, is we want to protect ourselves against viruses or malware or uh, ransomware, which is a big one. I don't want uh, to be in a situation in which my system has been locked by an attacker and I have no access to my data, and therefore we implement what we call continuous data protection, 
but it is not necessarily a security issue. We also want to protect our data against possible human error or any type of fault that causes uh, corruption. And there are many ways to implement this, but one relatively straightforward method is by implementing snapshots that are immutable, meaning you create them, but you can't change them, you can't write to them, you can't delete them, at least not with special privileges. And therefore, if something happens to my data, I always have these snapshots to recover from. Now, using snapshots as a backup is not something that's very new. What's different is that instead of taking a snapshot once a day, you could be taking a snapshot every 30 seconds. And that's a lot. That already ends up to be a lot of snapshots, a lot of objects, and then you want your storage controller to be able to support hundreds, thousands, hundreds of thousands of snapshots of storage objects um, in, er in order to be able to support such features. Okay, um, another topic I want to talk about a bit is failure domains. And a failure domain I'm talking about within a single system and just a disclaimer, obviously, I'm not talking about our storage systems. Our storage systems never fail. We're just theoretically speaking here, right? Um, so how much data would you place within a single storage system? What makes sense? And if we keep increasing the capacity of a single system, is that okay or has that become a problem because it's a very large failure domains? And we are, st we are hearing from clients even that they're saying, you know what, wait a minute, I don't want to put all my eggs in the same basket. That's a little bit too risky for me. I don't want a single system to have so much capacity. And you know, we're the engineers here, we're take capacity, we have amazing technology, here you go. And they're saying, you know, uh, no thank you, it's a bit much, at least as far as a single system. And the concern is, is if something happens to the system, a data loss event, or more typically a offline scenario, the entire system is offline. And I don't want so many of my applications to be offline. And it's not just failures. As I write here on the bottom of the slide, a failure could also be a type of security breach or something that happens that compromises the system. It isn't necessarily a hardware failure or a software bug. So, so what can we do about this? So one solution is which, which we're seeing is, yes, that's true, a single system is a single failure domain. And what customers do is they simply buy many, many, many small systems. Now, I'm not talking about, instead of buying one big one, buying three small ones. I'm thinking about customers, that instead of buying five big ones, they buy 15 small ones. And, and that's a lot. And that's just because they don't want such a large failure domain. So th this is an acceptable solution, and, and it works, and this is happening today already. But as you increase capacity, it kind of squeezes you into asking, OK, I could fit everything on one system. Do I need five? Do I need 10? How am I going to address that? And then they introduce the concept of a software failure domain. Here are all these uh, ones and zeros representing the software that's running on our system. So what we want to do now is separate the software into two separate failure domains. Now, why, why does that make sense? So let's discuss the failure model, model a bit, okay? So if we're talking about a single failure, that shouldn't be a problem, right? Any serious storage system has full redundancy, one fails, the other one takes over, we replace it, everything's good, that's not a system failure. If we do have a system failure, then you would typically recommend a customer to have a DR site. That's, that's what it was invented for. Your site goes down, amazing, you have another site, everything's good. So why is that not necessarily good enough? Well, first of all, DR sites are expensive. Not all customers use DR sites. Um, and even if they do, they don't use it on all their data. And even if they do have a DR site, the failover time also comes at a cost. 
So looking at a software failure domain now, why is that unique? Why is it different than a hardware failure domain? And the reason is, is because you're typically on all your nodes, you're running the same exact software with the same version. And if you have an error in one, you're going to have the same exact error in all your nodes within your, uh, within your cluster. And therefore, what's going to happen is that if you hit, let's for say, for example, a bug within your software that creates an issue, so what's going to lead to this is a very specific state of the machine, of uh, the data, of the flow, and once it fails, it's going to fail over to a second system. The thing is, a second system is running the same exact software and has the same exact bug, and it at a certain probability, not 100%, but far from zero as well, at a certain probability, the second node is going to hit the same exact failure, and then what happens is your first one fails, you fail over, the second one fails, bam, 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 offline. So therefore, software is it's a little bit more sensitive than the rest of the system, and it makes sense to have smaller software domains. And then what the proposal is is saying, okay, we have a single unit for hardware with amazing capacity and everything we've discussed, but we want to be able, within this hardware, to have separate software clusters, which each one is a failure domain within its own. So when we look at this, um, I've heard some extreme remarks in both directions, some saying like a capacity of a single system is never going to increase over a such and such amount of, uh, of petabytes. Um, I think it's more linked to the customer's um, actual business need. A customer, when he looks at the system, when he looks at a failure domain, he doesn't want to put too much in the same system, and that's for good reasons. But the thing is, he doesn't want to split it up endlessly either. And on one hand, he grows his applications, and he can scale within a system, and that's what I show here on this scale. As capacity grows, we're going to see both. We're going to see an increase in the number of systems, and we're going to see accordingly also the increase of capacity of a specific system. So exactly how far each one is going to be stretched, it's hard to say, and it's most likely even going to be very specific to every customer in his own interest, depending on how much you know, data his has been in his applications, depending on um, what level of reliability he has to give to his, uh, his customers, and there's going to be this, this trade-off, so it's always good to have all the options. So conclusions, just to go over briefly what we discussed. We had three main points. The first point we discussed was the storage to RAM ratio issue, and we gave several examples of how we could improve our architecture just by changing the software of the controller to support increased capacity without necessarily requiring any more RAM. The second point was the object proliferation, and here, we need, first of all, we need to support it. But secondly, we also need to be able to manage it. Having hundreds of thousands of objects within a system is not necessarily easy to manage. Some storage admin that has all these, he needs to know what to do with them. He, he needs uh, tools. So that's also a point to consider. And the third point we discussed is the issue of failure domain, where we split it into many systems, and we also, it, discuss the option of having multiple software failure domains. My main concluding remark is, specifically because capacity always increases, it could easily just fly by us without us paying attention. And today there are a set of circumstances that I think should merit us at least taking a peek at our architectures, looking at our storage controller, and seeing if maybe there's something to be done to prepare ourselves for the future capacities and technologies that we are receiving, each to his uh, own system's requirements. But there are several points that are changing and are very significant, and I think at least should uh, be uh, gazed upon to see if uh, something should be done within our architecture or not. Thank <laughs> you.